I want to look at an excerpt from my upcoming book, uh, The Budo Blueprint. Obviously, its content is connected closely to the uh, app. And everyone who's attached to the app, by the way, I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, thank you very much for your faith. And I hope you're finding the content inter interesting. We're up to the second week of the nine-week program. And uh, so far, I'm getting pretty good feedback. So that's very exciting. Yes, I do have copies. Uh, I've got a few copies. We're just about to do a uh, sales campaign building up to Christmas. So uh, if, if uh, yeah, by all means, I have copies. You can... You can uh, get a copy there, but make sure you click on the Australian link on the opening page at Budo Karate. There's an Australian link, and that will take you to a page where everything is done in Aussie dollars, by all means. Yep. Uh, thanks, Brad. Yeah, look, and I appreciate your input too, Brad. Uh, the app's really exciting, and it just gets better and better. Um, I'm very excited. Today, I, I want to do an excerpt from my book. Look, Bunkai, in some respects, it's the elephant in the room. Uh, people don't understand what it is. Us, thanks for coming, Paul. I hope everything's safe and sound in South Africa. Us, Raj Kumar from uh, Nepal. Namaste. Hope you're well. Um, so the, this is a little excerpt from my book, and the reason it's really important is, look, I wanted to talk about bunkai. We all have got to the point where we all understand what bunkai is. Um, but how to apply the bunkai is a completely different situation. So that's why I introduced that the Goju, Okinawan Goju concept of Kaisei no Gendi in the book, because that's really, really important. Usmak, good to see you. So Kaisai no Gendi, if you read the book uh, from about, I don't remember, page 200 or so, I don't have a copy with me. Um, Kaisai no Gendi talks about uh, the importance of breaking down and reconstructing. And it's really interesting because previously Kaisai no Gendi was called Toki to Musubi no Gendi. Gendi means principle. Toki to musubi. Musubi, we know from musubi dachi, means to tie. So it's the musubi dachi, obi o musubu. When you tie your belt knot, obi o musubu. So musubi means to tie. Toki, in this respect, means to untie or unravel. Okay, so it's really important when you look at kata, first thing you do is there's what I can see is three or four levels. First, you have the kata where you learn the fundamental moves. You learn the count, the moves, and you have to drill them exactly correctly, like a clone, like a Star Wars clone in the dojo. Everyone always says, if we talk about how to do a technique that taught, it has to be like a Star Wars clone. It's really important. Uh, so when you turn in the kata, it's done in a very specific way with the foot going to a very specific place, etc. Then the bunkai happens. Now, bunkai is simply a Japanese word which means uh, to compartmentalize or to break apart. It's a common verb, bunkai suru. So you've got to break it up. So you break it down into its bits. Then this is where the, the kaisai no genni comes in. Remember, kaisai no genni was a term that was coined it's not a common japanese word it's it's a word which i tend well it's it the kanji that make up the word kaisai uh as i wrote in the book they go back a long time in chinese martial arts okay so the principle of that kaisai is more easily understood if you think in terms of i was right yeah good on you <laughs> i couldn't remember mike um yeah, about page 200. So it's more easily understood if you work on the idea of the original term, which was toki to musubi no gendi. Toki, unravel, to musubi, to retie, 
Genli, the principle. So you take a kata, you break it, break it apart, and then you unravel it. You unravel its principles, its movements, its techniques, the angles. Is it a grab? Is it a punch? All, all techniques start with a strike, whether it's a kick or a punch or a grab. So you have to determine which of those is this technique. Then you work it and work it and work it and put it back together. And then the next step, the fourth step is oil. Oil means realistic, practical application. So to take a cutter apart and analyze it and work out applicable techniques in terms of a block is a throw, is a, a blow, a block is a lock, is a throw, is a blow, that's the very first step. That's a little bit like uh, somebody learning the kata movements by the numbers. That's it. That's the first step. Then after that, of course, 3,000 repetition, repetitions later and breaking it down and drilling the movements over and over and over will give you a much clearer understanding of where you're to, to go. Now, bunkai is the same. When you're working bunkai, it requires tremendous effort, thousands and thousands of repetition, repetitions under pressure to a degree, a, an increasing degree of non-compliance or, if you want, a, a decreasing degree of compliance. So having an opponent who does the kata movement and pauses there while you go through your movements and do this and that is... That's the equivalent of learning ABC. Then the bunkai translating into toki tomo subi no gendi or kaisai no gendi. That's where you're starting to string creative words together using the principles of, uh, of solid um, grammar. You can't break the rules of grammar, but you put those words together in a way that matches. And that takes thousands of repetitions i'm not uh i'm not trying to be melodramatic i just know from experience that anything less than that uh anything less than at least a thousand repetitions of a particular technique makes it very difficult now here's a really good formula that i use in the dojo if you practice a technique 100 times you have a 10 percent chance of pulling it off and I mean, that's 100 highly drilled, very accurate, very effective, very well done, perfectly executed repetitions. I don't mean, oh, yeah, he's throwing the punch. Oh, yeah, boom, boom, bang, boom, bang, boom, boom. That movement is one part of it, but the repetitions has to be, it has to come hard and fast, boom, and you have to, boom, you have to block, take it away. Block, take it away, control. Block, take it away, control. That sort of repetition a hundred times, and you'll be lucky to pull it off 10% of the time under pressure against a non-compliant opponent. Like my, my wrestling coach, Rico, used to say, there are you can practice a technique millions of times, and you'll be lucky to pull it off perfectly in competition once. He was a wrestler, a freestyle wrestler, because Everyone is different. Every opponent's movement is different. Their height, their body weight, their speed, their leverage, everything about what they do is different. So this is why you need to practice it so many times. If you practice it 200 times, I would give you about a 20% chance of pulling it off under pressure. If you practice it 500 times, it's a 50-50 proposition. So that's why you have to lead up and lead out. In other words, you practice that drill you have a, a, a strategic outcome in mind, but if it goes haywire, foobar, the old foobar, everything goes foobar, well, then your tactical variation on that is the lead out. That's what you have to do if things don't go right. It's your plan B and plan C, okay? If you practice it 800 times, focused, accurately, drilled really well, so that it's done perfectly, then you've got about an 80% chance of pulling it off. If you practice it focused with clarity, perfect movement, perfect timing distance about a thousand times, then you're, you're, you're approaching a point where you may be able to pull it off 
pretty well all the time. Okay. And this is these drills that I want to do today, uh, that I want to show you today. Uh, I'm sorry, talk about today. I can't show you because I don't have a training partner. Uh, these drills uh, are just really vital because you have to recognize that doing the kata, remember kata, um, we've discussed this before and I, I have a feeling uh, Sensei Mike Clark agreed, but I tend to feel that kata as we do them came after the two-man drills. You had people would come up with scenarios and they drill the scenarios and then at some stage somewhere they just turn them into a one-man drill, okay? And now what we tend to do is go back to two-man drill and say that that's from the kata. In actual fact, I think it's around the other way. So when you take a kata and turn it into a two-man drill, going in slow motion and experimenting with possible outcomes is not even within the first 10% of realism because what you have to do is you have to take that possible outcome and then have your opponent increasingly defend it and become more and more non-compliant to the point where you can do it 100% of the time, even if your opponent is doing everything in his power to not let you do it. If your opponent is doing everything in his power to let you do it, that's great. That's step one. But a thousand steps later, your opponent is bent on being non-compliant. That's really, really important. And these three uh, drills, which I'll discuss, uh, I think really, really work. So I'm going to read this, first of all, from the, the new book. This is part of the Bunkai section. It's not the entire Bunkai section. It's just part of the Bunkai section called Bunkai Training Three Drills. To help deepen your understanding of Bunkai, you can try these training methods that I use in the dojo. One, apply. This is a Yaksok Kumite drill. So Yaksok Kumite... Yes, correct. Well, I'm glad you agree. I hope I hope I hope we're right. <laughs> okay, so yaksoku kumite, yaksoku means is a prearrangement. It literally means a promise. So when when you you make a yaksoku in Japan, you make a promise. Another there's other words for it too. But yaksoku means prearranged uh kumite, prearranged techniques. So that's where two of you are getting together and you might be practicing the movements of the kata in a prearranged fashion. So that's grade one, kindergarten, first point, everyone has to go there first. Everyone has to start there first. Okay. It's a yaksoku kumite drill. Isolate a particular technique or flow from a kata. Does it begin with a grab or a blow? Drill it accordingly building up the intensity as appropriate. Then in kumite training later on, incorporate that move by having the instructor call out, apply, or any similar command. Now, I, I use the word apply in the dojo simply because there are a couple of other words which I use for the other two drills that we're going to go over today. It has to be different. It has to be clearly different. And apply is a little bit of an awkward word which indicates that what you're doing is a little bit of an awkward drill. So the instructor calls out, apply. You could be doing kumite. And on that command, without a pause, the uke, okay, that's the person who's having the technique practice on them, and it's pre-designated. So uh, at the beginning of, of kumite, you say, all right, we're going to do an apply tonight. So we have to designate, decide who's, who's attacking first. So the uke then attacks the tori, the one practicing the technique, who deals with that attack using the actual bunkai technique being practiced that day. After a few repetitions, the training partners switch roles. This can be expanded to allow the attack to be with any grab or blow and the response aiming to be, deal with the attack in accord with the meditation contemplation three second control rule which i talk about in another part of the book this puts bunkai training into a more realistic practice so for a start the meditation contemplation three second rule that's just a rule it's not original oh good to see you rochelle i'm glad you made it 
you got here? Uh, the meditation comp contemplation uh, is a thing. I forget where I read it. There was a, is an American. There was an American Kempo. Ed Parker. Ed Parker came up with some pretty funky little funnies, and one of them he said was, "He who hesitates meditates horizontally." <laughs> so I call that the hesitation meditation rule. In other words, uh, I mean the contemplation meditation rule. So in other words, in the dojo, what we do, even in gradings, when we get someone will be doing a high level grading and they'll have to demonstrate a bunkai application uh, and self-defense against a non-compliant opponent. And that opponent will be told you can attack them with anything you want. It could be a grab, a punch, a kick, it could be anywhere. They don't know where it's coming. It's not like you go, okay, I'm going to defend against a right punch to here. You don't have that luxury. If someone says, I'll attack me with the right punch here, you can close your eyes and pick it up. It's so kind of, uh, it's it's very, very fundamental. Nothing wrong with it. It's a step you go through. But if you're grading for, say, third down, well, then you want to be able to show that the opponent attacks you with anything that they choose. You have to control it, finish, and get them on the ground in a control position within three seconds. So that's the three-second contemplation meditation rule. So that's what that means. So that you see that drill, that apply drill. What you're doing is you've been working on a certain bunkai in training. Then at kumite, you take, you just do normal kumite, and then the instructor will yell out, apply. And then one of you, which is predetermined, will attack, and you then use that bunkai drill you've been working on under pressure against a degree of non-compliance. So that's the first level. It's really, really uh, interesting. Okay, the next level I call down. So this is the second drill. We call this down. And this is solid gold. I really think this. Okay, next, and this was an ad adaptation. A friend of mine, Eric Paulson, you may have heard of him. He uh, um, combat submission wrestling. He fought in the second UFC. I reckon he probably would have been on his way to win it. <laughs> except he had a long hair and a pigtail and the boxer he fought in the semi-final just grabbed his hair and pulled his hair back, which they were allowed to do. And so every time he'd set the boxer up, the boxer would just pull his hair. And then he, and then the next day he cut his hair off and he's never had long hair again. But anyway, Eric Paulson, I've spent a lot of time training with Eric. He's a good friend uh, and a good teacher and a very realistic approach to training and fighting. And this is an adaptation of a di idea that he taught me. During any two-man drilling, whether it's Ippon Sambon or Jiu Kumite, Kata Bunkai drilling, self-defense, or even fitness training, so any time, any scenario, you could be sitting down having a cold glass of water after training. The instructor may at any time call out, down. Now, on the command, the students will engage with each other and attempt, you know, and obviously not five on one, two on a one on one. Engage with each other and attempt to take each other down any way possible and contain the opponent with control. The degree of intensity is determined by the experience of the student, the environment being trained in, and considerations such as injuries, tournament proximity, proximity, and so on. If one does go down, he attempts to drag his partner down with him. So in other words, there's a, a lessening of compliance because the reality is you practice a lot of techniques that you think are realistic when they're completely unrealistic simply if your opponent drags you and pulls you down with them. A lot of the time we practice a technique, take them down, it's nice and clean, and you finish. But if your opponent is half smart as you take him down he's going to grab you and take you down with you or take you down with him and if he does that well then it's a whole different ball game if both go to the mat the aim is to get back up on your feet whilst controlling your partner this can be done with or without strikes this helps the students to be aware of how distance affects response and the applications found in the kata vary according to range 
Okay, that's a really important point. That's a really valid exercise. We love doing this. It's we just anytime, anywhere. I'll just yell out to the kids they're doing kumite down, and they know ex immediately what they do. They'll be doing kumite. Next thing you know, they close in. They try to take each other down to the ground and control. Now, um, it's a valid, very valid drill because it's very realistic. Okay, um, and when I say there. The aim is to get back on your feet while control, controlling your partner. Saul Sai said in, um, uh, in This is Karate, he, Saul Sai said, see, the groundwork techniques, newaza. Okay. Anyone who's grappled will be familiar with the term newaza, means the groundwork. Saul Sai said, in karate, there are newaza techniques. The difference between Martial arts, whose primary objective is newaza, in other words, wrestling, uh, judo, um, BJJ. Um, so wrestling, you win the match by pinning their shoulders on the ground. Judo, you win the match by throwing them back on the ground or by holding them on the ground for a set amount of time. Uh, BJJ, your objective is to get them on the ground and control them. The objective of those particular martial arts or sports, their sports really, is to stay on the ground, get them on the ground, finish it on the ground. But Solsai said the difference between karate groundwork and the groundwork of the, the art, the fighting arts he mentioned with judo, wrestling, and aikido, the objective of those is to get them on the ground and finish them on the ground. It's very interesting. But also I said, karate's objective is to get them on the ground, finish them, but don't go to the ground. For you, it doesn't finish there. You're a primarily a stand-up fighter, so your objective is not to go to the ground, but your objective is also, as part of karate training, know what to do if you do go to the ground. So that's a very important distinction that I make there. If you both go to the ground, you're not going to turn it into a BJJ rolling session. What you're doing is... You can use punches, kicks, strikes, do whatever you can, obviously within the realms of safety, to control your opponent whilst you get back, back to your feet. That's very important. Okay. Now the third drill I call go. So the first one, apply. Remember I said that's a funky word. It's an awkward word simply because it's meant to be, because it points out that the degree of prearranged motion there uh, between the two students is much, much higher. The second one is down. And down is simply wherever you are, whatever you're doing, when you hear the word down, you try to take your opponent down to the ground and control them with the three-second rule. Get them on the ground within three seconds if possible. Oh, it, often it takes a lot longer because if your opponent is highly, you've only got to watch the judo match, which can go for 10 minutes with two guys trying to take each other down. So when your opponent is highly skilled, the chances of you getting on the ground go from good to close to zero if they know what they're doing. So that's where the skill of change, transition, range, transition comes in. Okay, so the third one is called go. This is for when drilling bunkai specifically and is comparable to a kind of bunkai kumite, if you like. When the students are drilling a particular bunkai flow with full compliance and cooperation, on a given command, for example, go. The students will attempt to use the Carter applications being worked on whilst the uke, rather than be fully compliant, will, to the degree the training part of the training partner's uh, experience, also attempt to counter the move and take his partner down with control. This shows the possibilities that can arise with a non-compliant assailant and frees up the mind to adapt to change as it arises. So, for example, uh, Caius, if you're still there, you know the video that the videos you sent me of you doing that that uh, the bunkai uh, work, which I presume you're going to keep working on and so on, because uh, that's a good, a really good starting point. And if you were to apply this, if you have someone there during the drill say to you, "Go," then what happens is the uke, the person you're doing the drill to, the, the person you're applying that drill to suddenly goes from being completely compliant 
to completely non-compliant and tries to take you down instead. And that's a really good pressure test to see if the techniques that you're working on uh, uh, work. I'm just mentioning Kais because he sent a good video of him doing bunkai from Pinan Kata. And uh, I think if you apply this to that Kais, you'll really get some good growth out of that. So can you see how the go works? It's like when you're doing specific bunkai drill application, it's your opponent comes in, you're defending, you're turning that block into a lock, you're taking them down to the ground. And then at the point of go, all of a sudden, you start to realize where the weaknesses in your stance and the weaknesses in your connections are because now they can turn it around on you, okay? These training drills help the student to see and experience the connection between kata applications and live movement beyond normal dojo kumite. Adapt them to your training as you see fit. They can be easily scaled according to the skill level of the students. This training is enjoyable and tough and a real eye-opener if you are not used to it. When I say an eye-opener, it really is. If you think you have the bunkai down, you're in for a shock when someone does a go or it does it down on you. You're practicing, you're doing it, bang, down, boom. Next thing you know, you're on the back thinking, oh, that bunkai application, which I thought I'd mastered, I just realized because I've only done 10 reps, it's not quite working yet. A word of warning though, be careful and considerate. Injuries occur with this type of training because of the unpredictability. So that's the thing. One of the reasons, in fact, I would... I would guess that the only reason we train the way we train is for safety. The only reason we don't do 100% all out, full on practical techniques in training all the time is the safety factor. We wouldn't last, we'd be so many injuries. And the, the reason for injury is unpredictability. And the number one cause of injury, the number one cause of injury in the dojo is gravity, is uncontrolled gravity. So when you're taking someone from a standing position to down to the floor, if you don't have control of their movement and if you don't have control of your movement, then gravity will do the rest. The number one cause of injury in the dojo is uncontrolled movement caused by gravity. A word of warning, yep. Work with a trusted partner and have agreement about the level of intensity. You gear it up. You start slow as smooth, smooth as fast. You gradually build up. Remember the slowness. It's a little bit like someone trying to learn how to box, wanting to learn how to box, but never ever getting past the point where they just have their training partner throw slow punches. Work with a trusted partner and have agreement about the level of intensity. With experience, you feel the point of no return in any movement, at which point non-compliance relaxes into submission to prevent injury. So what I mean by that is if someone is taking you down, you resist, you resist, you resist, you resist, and then there's a point, there's a point in that movement of no return. You realize that no matter how much you struggle, the more you struggle now, the more you're going to compromise your ability to hit the ground safely. So at that point of no return, you relax, you don't continue your non-compliance, you save yourself, you save everything. And then later on, when you hit the deck, if you want, you can start to grab them down. If, like I know from experience too, that when someone's taking you down, it can be very much so that by holding on to them, you actually reduce your own impact and you can use their momentum and swing them over and, and reverse it like that. So that's very realistic too. That's a different thing. But above all, avoid injury. It's enjoyable, as I say. It's very tough training, very exhausting, very tough training. It's very realistic, but there, because of the uh, unpredictability of it, there can be a degree of injury if you're not careful. In fact, Ben, uh, who is the head instructor at my dojo, Ben Ajamian, uh, he injured his knee about, oh, I think, probably close to a year ago now, uh, simply because of that sort of thing. When um, we were going, he was doing something, I was 
going down to the ground. And as I went down, he slipped and he hyperflexed his knee and damaged his knee and it's taken a year for it to come good. What has led to the slight variation of kata movements in Bunkai amongst certain Kyokushin groups, at times even individual dojos, for example, Pinan Ni, Kanku, Takis and so on? I just, look, that's a pretty broad-based question, Tigre, and I think it would be probably wrong of me to give what I think is a definitive, definitive answer, but I'm guessing for a start it can be a limitation in the ability of the instructor uh, it can be uh, that they feel like they need to keep teaching something new to keep the students. Uh, it can be forgetfulness. A certain technique will come here, but you forget and go there, or it's here. Little things like that, you get confused after too many kata. So, and then uh, sometimes instructors are too embarrassed to admit they don't know. So they you know, no, this is the way it's done. And then you've got a change in the kata, which never really existed. But the other thing, the main thing is, I think the variations come to the interpretation of the movements. So like Mahatma Gandhi said, the, the interpretation of any writing often goes way beyond what the writer was actually writing about because the reader has a different set of experiences that place a different interpretation on those words. So quite often you can read something, five people can read something and see different interpretations. And it's not unique to karate. Look at religion. Look at all the Christian religions out there, all the different sects and different churches and religions and so on all based on a different interpretation of scripture okay so it's the same thing excuse me for wiping my nose um so i think there's a lot of reasons for it but i don't mind that actually tigre i think it's actually that's one of the things that keeps karate alive all those variations means that people are out there and they're thinking about it they're putting their their, their mind to possibilities and the little variations quite often so in my dojo, for example, there are certain things, even Taikyoku, some of them go down here and then the arm comes up before you move next. Some the arm stays down and then moves in and they both have really solid applications if you interpret it. I think the only problem arises when you look at it and go, no, that's wrong, it's stupid, it's da -da, it's not like that. And that's where your mind gets closed. Okay, you've got to be open to all that sort of stuff. It can be a little confusing sometimes. Oshiyan, my judo sensei, Rob, has a similar drill to down. We walk around and make eye contact with each other and on command you engage the one you got. Well, there you go. That's very similar to down because I think that eye contact that your instructor does, and he sounds like a pretty smart man, <laughs> but if you don't make eye contact first, that opens the door to even greater unpredictability and even greater injury. If they go down and you just blindside someone, well, then obviously there's going to be injury. So you always make con eye contact first to determine who your partner is. Good point, actually. Um, so they're the three drills that I think that we use anyway in the dojo that I think really offer a really great uh, avenue into taking your bunkai training to a deeper, deeper level. Okay, and that's really, really important that the, the notion of uh, bunkai is one thing. The idea that you break a kata down into components and work on those is another thing. The next step, of course, is now you have to interpret those movements according to block, lock, blow, throw, and find suitable practical application for them. That's another thing. And then take that to a level of non-compliance. Um, I've often mentioned my buddy Nick Hughes, who uh, everyone will be familiar that I've mentioned. He wrote the fantastic book, How to Be Your Own Bodyguard, uh, which we have mentioned numerous times. Uh, and I don't know, I haven't looked at Nick's webpage for a while, but in the old days he used to say a veteran of over 2,000 street encounters. I think he was being modest, and I know he hasn't had a street fight for 20 years. But 
Nick will tell you that many of them, if not a vast majority of them, uh, were based on kata movement. That's, you know, that kata movement, um, if you take it from doing the kata by numbers to bunkai, compliance level bunkai. When you have bunkai, when you have say uh, when you um, have bunkai with compliance, that's really vital for a starting point to safety. But then you have to obviously take it to an increasing level of non-compliance. I'm reminded of Sei Shin Tannen. Exactly, Sei Shin Tannen, Sei Shin Spirit, and Tannen means training, or, or uh, in this case. Um, and I'm guessing I, I didn't read I don't know if you put a, a the Seishin Tannen that Mike's referring to is a form I guess an objective of training with deep 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 repetition okay so that you're not just training your body you can't separate Shingi Tai Okay, you can't pull, you can't do one without the other two playing a role. It's like three legs on a chair. They all play a role. Uh, so when you do, when you drill a technique, okay, so you want to master a particular technique, that requires incredible volumes of drilling. But to do that incredible volumes of drilling, which is gi of shingi tai, it takes tremendous concentration and tremendous willpower so that's shin, and it also takes tremendous conditioning. That's tai. So shingi tai. When Mike and I could be speculating, Mike, and tell me if I'm wrong. Please be comfortable telling me if I'm wrong. If you're referring to something thing, something different. But se shin tannen means forging the spirit in terms of shingi tai, so that when you drill a technique, you're also forging the spirit because what is required to drill that technique to a level, a high level of Mastery also requires a high level of mental involvement and concentration. It also can uh, requires a high level of conditioning. It takes 1,000 days to learn, 10,000 days to polish. The difference between victory and defeat is measured in the fraction of the second. Yes, indeed. I think uh, my friend Rico mentioned when he said that it's a similar thing. You can, you can drill something tens of thousands, millions of times, and you'll, you'll be lucky to pull it off perfectly once in competition. Or if you do, every time you pull it off perfectly in competition, remember he's a wrestler, so he's talking about sport. If you do pull it off more than once in competition, the way you pulled it off will be different every time because everyone is different. So there you go. A thousand days to learn, three years to learn something. Remember in the old days they used to say, tachi san nen, ski san nen, uh, uh, Nigiri san nen, tachi san nen, ski san nen, nigiri san nen. Three years to master the stance. That's a thousand days. Three years to master the uh, the grip, and three years to master the strike. That's why I'd spend nine years on one kata. And so yeah, and ten thousand or thirty years to polish it. And it's funny, you, you know, you mentioned that, and I know for myself that I can do. Sun, I can do Tencho. And some people will look at me and go, well, the way you're doing it, your hands at the wrong angle or whatever. I, I, don't, I don't really care about what they say anymore. But I know from my own experience that when I do Tencho now, the, what is going on on a spiritual level, if you like, uh, on the technical level of my imagination is so vastly different to 10 years ago and to 20 years ago and to 30 years ago and to 40 years ago when I first learned the kata. So this is, it's so true what Mike says there in that realistically, not only is it a thousand reps, but also a thousand days. But that also gives you an idea of how hard it is to rep out something a thousand times. How you take a technique, if you want to drill it, you do it 10 times. And if you did that 10 times, uh, 
twice a week, let's say, that's still 12 months before you hit a thousand reps. I'm only guessing, um, probably even more than 12 months before you hit a thousand reps. So to hit a thousand reps, I'm, do, I'm doing a whole section in the uh, Budo Blueprint app for the people on the nine week course. I have a whole section on the mindset of drilling so that you understand how serious it is to get to where you are doing that thousand reps. Oh, good, Mike. Yeah, it's a great, very interesting book. Paul, good question. How do you keep evolving while the mind we while the body weakens due to age and injuries? I you've been watching. <laughs> I'm not going to training today simply because my the, my frozen shoulder bursitis is out of this world painful. Um, I haven't slept for two days because of it. So uh, that's a true thing. I think I think Paul, the approach you take is you learn first of all to psychologically emotionally become comfortable with your own body changes then you can be like brad and get sneaky with old age that's true too uh but um you you learn to move within the range of your own capability i mean mac robertson's here he's in the same boat as us um and he understands too how the body changes over time you cannot train the way you did at 20 if you're in your 60s. Um, I always say that if you're training in your 60s as hard as you were training in your 20s, then all that says is you weren't training very hard in your 20s <laughs> because it's absolutely physically impossible except for performance-enhancing drugs, people who do, do uh, you know, testosterone supplements or or steroids or human any of those things which artificially exogenously improve the body to try and keep it youthful well, that's a different thing there's nothing i can say about that i just uh I, I don't follow that path i think it's the trick is to uh be comfortable with the way your body changes and make adaptations accordingly this will sound wrong i know but at some point you have to throw what you've learned away because cry on that too mike I agree. And this is why when I learnt Tensho, it's very specific. And then many years ago at one of the world tournaments, I think it was the fifth or sixth world tournament, Shihan Bobby Lowe, who's like the oracle of Tensho and Kyokushin, uh, Shihan Bobby Lowe and I did a demonstration of Tensho. And I was really pretty solid with my Tensho, but that experience of spending a couple of days with Shihan Bobby Lowe rehearsing that kata, that increased my feeling for what was going on another 20%, if you like. So I think, like most things, you know, uh, there's a famous story of a race car driver who was coming along. He was doing about 300 kilometres an hour down a straight. And around the corner where he couldn't see, there was a massive pileup. And if he kept going at the rate he was going, he wouldn't have been able to stop and there's a very good chance he would have died. But he knew something was fishy. He had a feeling something was fishy. And so where he would normally be catapulting out of that corner into the next straight, he slowed right down. And later on, they asked him, they looked at it from the air. It was impossible that he could have seen what was going on when he started to slow down and even he couldn't work out what the feeling was. Then he realized because he didn't believe in sixth sense, all that sort of thing. Then he realized what it was, was the crowd was different because he was leading the race. Normally when he's tearing down the track, the faces are watching him, but at a point the faces were watching somewhere else and he didn't even look at them. He just felt the, the, everything was different. They're all looking that way instead. So he thought, no, something's fishy, and he slowed down. Well, that's the feeling. And it's the same when Mike talks about, uh, I don't know that it sounds wrong, and I'm, I'm the language you use I think is very realistic, but you do have to put a – this is the argument you see sometimes. I'll go and do a seminar, and I'll be saying to someone, trying to describe a certain movement in a carter, 
and I'll have someone who's a second Dan who will lecture me because my hand is wrong. You go, yeah, okay, sorry. Well, okay, fine, thanks. Yep, thank you for that. But the point is there is a point where you have to realize that all your technical drilling and training is leading towards nothing more than getting an intuitive feeling to, that makes it work properly. <laughs> Brad, that makes me real sneaky. Okay, so there's a little bit of an input there. Yeah, they do, but then, you know, why bother crawling before you can walk? Because it's not like you're going to go back to crawling at any time. I'm on a path to showdown. One question keeps me awake for now. How do I make sure I'll be a good ambassador for Solsai and pass on his message untainted? Well, that's a good, that's a very admirable uh, idea, Paul. Probably the first thing is uh, keep loyal to Solsai's teachings. Keep loyal to the spirit of Kyokushin and make sure that when you train, you train in a way that leads to uh, proof, respect, like that. So also says, without experience, no proof, without proof, no trust, without trust, there's no respect. That's what you want to do. Remember that everything, Paul, everything you do comes back to that experience, that accumulation of experience, which engenders uh, engenders proof which creates proof that engenders trust and that's the the only way not the best way the only way to become a worthy ambassador for soul sire is work your training well so that the body of knowledge and experience that you develop becomes a body of proof that people then can look at and trust you with Jed, Mike, Jed's a long-time buddy of mine. We go back over 30 years. We trained together for many years. Uh, and uh, uh, I know he has your books. So uh, Jed's a good buddy. I was just over there a couple of weeks ago at his house. He lives on an island just off the coast of Brizzy. So anyway, look, thank you, everybody. I hope there was something useful in that for you. That's an excerpt from my uh, book, uh, The Budo Blueprint. I uh, hope uh, you enjoyed that. Thanks for your input, Mike Clark. Uh, it's always an honor to have you here. I know I, I always sound like I'm pissing in your pocket, but I'm not. It's a genuine honor to have someone of your experience along. Mac Robinson, you're the same. When you come along too, it, it adds a lot of honor for me to think that uh, you guys, between the two of you, have got probably 100 years of training. So um, it's a real honor for me to come along. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Thank you for making the effort. I know you're um, you're a little bit uh, busy, but good on you for coming. So thank you, Tigray, us. Thank you, Daniel, us. Didn't know you were even there, Daniel. Thank you today, always. Thank you, Mike. Chrissy Dunn, my nephew. Good on you, buddy. Paul, good. Danke schön, mein Freund. Thank you, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again real soon. Us. 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 Us.